So, uh, thank you very much for coming to this last talk of Juice. I hope you all had a great day. Um, oh God, I'm speaking American again. A good day is probably what I should say. You uh, learned a lot and uh, yeah, you're looking forward to, uh, I think it's rather gray outside. You're not actually missing a beautiful afternoon. So, uh, let me talk a little bit about what I'm going to uh, be, be talking about here. So what I would like to discuss a little bit is um, you know, how to think about building out your continuous delivery toolkit. That's the title of the talk after all. And I am not going to come here and give you some magic recipe for you need to use Docker and you need to use Chef and you need to use Ansible and you need to use something like that. So I'm not going to pretend that there is some amazing assortment of tools that will magically solve your problems. But I want to talk more about how to approach this. And this is a Jenkins user conference. So one of the things that you might be asking yourself and that I should start with is, but I thought you were going to talk only about Jenkins. And I think this is one of the questions that I would like to ask because I've built like a whole bunch of what I might call delivery systems and uh, the, I heard a nice analogy. I've used Jenkins as a Christmas tree and I've hung all kinds of stuff onto it, way more than it should ever have had on it. And that at some point starts to get not very fun for various reasons. You run into some technical challenges, you run into some conceptual like impotence mismatches and all these kind of things. And one of the things I learned um, very quickly having done this a few times is that especially when you're trying to solve a, a problem like continuous delivery, but the same thing goes for DevOps or, or many other types of uh, process changes, is they're trying to think about, you know, I have a tool and it's got a plugin mechanism, so <laughs> if I just write enough plugins, it's going to do everything I want it to do. It's not the right way to approach the problem. Um, and I if you like, if you take one thing away from this talk, then that's probably the most important thing. You have a goal in mind. You're trying to do something. And you know, some tools you already have that will help you with parts of this, and some tools, well, won't. And then you have to make some smart trade-offs about whether it's time to look at another piece of tool, tooling or write your own or uh, use a manual process or whatever it is. But think about what you want to achieve rather than I have a tool, everything, I've got the hammer and whatever the problem is, I'm going to make it look like a nail or I'm going to write a plugin that turns it into a nail. So yes, I think it is okay to think about other tooling that you may want to use for a particular challenge, especially a challenge like continuous delivery. And as I said, if you've taken Jenkins and used some of the seven, I think it was 350 or so, the latest count, quite a few of which do the same thing, but that's a whole different discussion. And you've added it all and hooked it all in and you now have 750 jobs in 27 pipelines and you've used all these great plugins that uh, I've written about and used it at great length and I love a lot of them. Yeah, you can do anything with Jenkins. I think the smart question is, does it make sense to try to do everything with Jenkins? So if you've already done this a few times, you might have hit a couple of challenges. You might have either realized that you know, the maintenance effort um, is starting to get a little big uh, at jCloud. So when I'm not doing my day job, I'm uh, working on Apache jClouds, and we have, I don't know, I think something like 100 or so Jenkins jobs in a, a build farm donated by CloudBees, very nice of them. And whenever we have to change some setting in some of our deployment jobs or whatever, it's, you know, there's CLI scripting and all this weird stuff going on. It's a, it's a bit of a maintenance pain. Or the other thing that you sort of realize is that every tool, whether it's Jenkins or any other tool in your toolkit, will have a sweet spot and a domain model that is designed for that sweet spot. And all these tools have extension mechanisms. So if you write enough code, you can get any tool to do anything you want, more or less more or less, not make a coffee most likely, but more or less. But very quickly you go way beyond, you get out of the sweet spot and you kind of initially you know when you're out of the sweet spot and then you get a little further but the temptation is always there to just go this little bit further and at some point it, it just becomes really painful. So use your, your instinct here, just because M Collective can run any command on any machine doesn't mean it's ideally suited to do everything. And the same goes for Jenkins. Once you feel, once you notice that you're getting too far out of the sweet spot of a tool, really think hard about whether it makes sense to go in that direction. Having said that, we love Jenkins. I mean, I, I, at my day job, at all the open source projects I work on, we use Jenkins extensively. This is a screenshot I just took from some of the bunch of plugins that we uh, we use in our Jenkins, but we use Jenkins for continuous integration. Because continuous integration is what I would consider. We can have long discussions with Kosuke and they're very interesting, but I think the sweet spot of Jenkins, and if you look at the out-of-the-box support and the domain model and things like that, continuous integration 
is really the thing that Jenkins is really particularly good at. Some of the things we use, you know, they help us do our continuous integration better, build failure, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know whether Andrew Bayer, I think he's going to be, one of the other talks, he wrote the Throttle Concurrent Builds plugin. He's here, so thank you very much, Andrew, uh, if you're in the audience. But, as I said, at some point you will hit um, the edges of your CI tool if you're doing CI. That might be Jenkins because you're here, but it could be any CI tool. Um, and then you start to run into a couple of challenges. These challenges can be uh, technical. Uh, the, the CI tool doesn't scale. Uh, it doesn't have ability to support a certain type of build that you need to do. It doesn't integrate with a certain SEM system. Uh, we need to get people to access it who don't understand it, who can't make sense of the interface. Uh, we can't figure out the access control. Or it can be conceptual. Um, anybody who's used the folders plugin or who's uh, used promoted builds will have wondered why you run a job every time you promote a build. Uh, there you could see some of this conceptual problem coming through. It was just never intended to support this idea of, of having arbitrary attributes on an existing job. So what you have to do is you have to use the job engine. Everything becomes a job, et cetera, et cetera, even a folder. I mean, a folder is a type of, you know, that kind of stuff. But this is a luxury problem. I mean, I think anybody who writes a tool, and that certainly goes for me in my day job, we wish we were in this position. 500,000 or whatever the latest number is worldwide users. That's great. It's a luxury problem. There's no need to be ashamed of saying at some point that a tool is, is you know, maybe it, it's a little crazy to try to do certain things with a tool. But let's be honest, pretty much anything is possible with Jenkins. There's a trillion plugins to do a lot of things. And you can always write your own plugins. And I think there were some talks here today about how exactly to go about doing that in a good way. And I heartily encourage you, the Jenkins, Jenkins lives through its plugin community, through its community. So if you are interested, if you have a challenge in the CI space and you can't find a good plugin to do it, uh, then by all means, uh, contribute. So really what I would like to talk about um, is this sort of this onion or the, the overall set of challenges um, that are both technical and organizational that you start to address when you look at continuous delivery is this end-to-end -end problem. So, you know, uh, continuous delivery, definition on Wikipedia, a set of processes and practices to, you know, speed up delivery of valuable software straight to your customer. Who here does uh, agile development? Who runs some agile development practice? Uh, okay, um, do you know, and some people have tired arms. That's also good. Uh, so there's a sentence that uh, I often use when I do continuous delivery presentations, which is our most, uh, I think it's our highest priority is the continuous delivery, there's that phrase, of valuable software to our customer. That is principle number one from the Agile Manifesto. So if you're not delivering to your customer, you're not agile. That's a bit brutal and I don't think it's true in reality, but it's worth bearing this in mind. I spoke to Jeff Sutherland, the guy who created Scrum, and he said, in his trainings, he asked the same kind of question. So who does, no, who does Agile? And everybody goes, yeah, that's why we're here. And they go, who delivers to their customer at the end of every sprint? One person out of like 25 or something. So think about this. Anyway, the point here is that, you know, I've tried to look, look at this from a bit of a Jenkins-specific uh, view in the sense that the center of the onion represents what I would consider to be the core sweet spot of Jenkins in this space. Build CI, it's what it does excellently. I, you know, the most widely used tool out there, what more do I need to say than that? You have a lot of other things that you want to do around your code. So unit testing, static code analysis, you know, all those kind of things that examine your code as you are building it and preparing it for delivery. Um, and then as we start to get as the layers of the onion start to get further and further away, we start to run into some things that are very important for continuous delivery, but that are maybe not quite so easy uh, to do. Um, and again, I think what I'm inviting you to think about is how well, how easy they are to do in your specific context. So one of the next ones is environment provisioning. Right? This is not about, I'll talk more about it in a second, but this is really about making sure you have environments to which you can deploy your applications. And then you have to do the deployment itself. You know, you've got your code built. You now need to get it running. Uh, then you have test management. I'll talk about what that is a little further on. 
Uh, and so that's not testing itself. Jenkins is good at running a whole bunch of different types of tests, but how to use that data in a, in a realistic and a sensible way. And then you have the whole end-to-end -end sort of pipeline, the release management thing. And right at the extreme outer layer of the onion, you actually have your customers uh, or your users or the people who are really asking for these features to be built. So they're, they're, you know, they're the people who are ultimately, the, the, the end goal of continuous delivery is to get stuff to them and to help them understand where certain things are. So these are technical topics, and we'll talk about them in a technical way. But it's also about the audience. Each one of these things that I've just mentioned has a different target audience. And uh, one of the challenges in continu getting continuous delivery toolkit or a continuous delivery toolkit right is about making sure you present the right information to the right people in a way that they can consume. Um, so for instance, if you're looking at test results, you have to present them in such a way that maybe both the, the business owner who has to make a decision, but also the tester who needs to analyze them and figure out where the test went wrong and why it went wrong and so on, uh, can see the information that they need to see. So before I now go in and talk about some of these technical things that your continuous delivery toolkit needs to address and what kind of tooling you might want to use for it, let me reiterate a couple of things. CD is one of the, one of the most common uh, questions or, or I get from people is, we want to do CD. How do we do it? And that's great for us as a vendor. We love that because we tell them, well, you, you know, buy our products and perfect. No. CD is a means. It's not a goal. You as an organization have to decide what your goal actually is. Do you want to release more quickly? Do you want to release more reliably? Do you not care about this at all? And you, know, you don't need to do it. You also need to end up choosing your, the tooling for your continuous delivery toolkit to match the goals that you have. So there is no silver bullet. I'm not going to come and say, as I said, you know, these are the seven tools. They've proven themselves in every situation. They will give you exactly what you need. It just doesn't work that way. You need to figure out what you want to achieve, and then you can go and identify whether you need different tools, more tools, whether you can use the tools you have, uh, and so on. And I mean, I'll give you an example, kind of interesting for us ourselves as EBL Labs. We are a product company, so we sell our products, uh, software products, and I would love, you know, we are technically set up pretty much to make a new version of our products every day or so. Um, but the people, our customers don't want that at all. They go crazy, like, my God, more than one release a month? We never, we don't want to update software once a day. Uh, we need to get a process. We have a process in place for this kind of stuff. So even though we'd like to, our customers don't want us to. So again, it, it, it's about the goals that you have for this particular process. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about in the next, what is it, about half an hour or so, maybe we'll finish a little quicker so you can get, get out a little earlier, is five particular technical uh, areas in continuous delivery um, and how I've seen those addressed and how we think they can be addressed in different circumstances. The five are, uh, there's more, of course, and there's more in the onion, but the five I want to talk about here are build and continuous integration, um, environment provisioning, deployment, application deployment, test management, and um, yeah, it's an interesting discussion in its own right, release management slash pipeline orchestration. And I'll talk about why I put those two in the same line uh, when we get to it. Let's also not forget, you know, this is a partially going to be a technical talk, but one of the big challenges about getting CD right is it's not just tools. It's also different teams involved, and different teams have very different backgrounds, experiences, expectations. Okay, so so who's here, who here is from what you might consider the development side of the house, development team? About 60%. Operations, uh, the other half, and then, and then QA. I uh, see, again, so we have our room represents this, right? And there are different people involved in CD, and in order to make CD effective in an organization, it's not just about getting the right tools to do the right tasks, it's also about supporting interaction between these teams. And th this, this is starting to get a bit of a DevOpsy discussion. We can have a long discussion about that later. But basically, yeah, each of these different processes will touch or primarily live with a certain team. I, there's no hard and fast rule. This is just from my experience, what we see quite often. 
And the interesting one is the one at the bottom because again, that's the whole end-to-end -end process, which really involves pretty much everybody. Um, what's missing here a little bit is the customer. I guess if I were to put them somewhere, they would be somewhere at the bottom, um, but not many people I've spoken to are actively involving their customer in this process beyond say doing something like um, canary deployments or A-B testing where you really are asking your customer to basically validate your software uh, before you make it fully live. So there's always, there's never a bad reason to put this, you know, I'm sure you've seen this in like 10,000 different versions, but it's always fun to have out there. Long story short, every team that you speak to will have a different idea of what CD can or should or will mean for them. And I guess one of the, uh, yeah, one, of the, one of the examples of that is I've, I've spoken to many teams about continuous integration, one of the five I'm going to talk about. And if you speak to developers, they kind of, yeah, it's clear. Well, they typically say, oh, yeah, we have a Jenkins server, um, which is great, but Jenkins server is not CI. CI is a practice. Jenkins server helps you do it. There's a very interesting blog called Continuous Integration on a Dollar a Day where somebody describes how to do CI with a old server, a bell, and a rubber chicken. No CI server in sight. Um, so let's not forget, you know, just running a server doesn't give you CI, but developers, most of the development community knows what it is. Speak to people in QA, well, the reaction is, well, what's CI? You know, we do testing. Um, and it, it changes, of course, and it depends on the organization. Speak to the database people. Yeah, the idea of having, like, no, 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 we will, you will send us your SQL, and then we will review it manually. Um, and uh, then we will run it uh, by pushing on the button or copy-pasting it into the console or whatever. So this idea of you know, continuous integration with database stuff, very, very rare. Um, for a release manager, maybe not for a release engineer, but for a release manager, a CI tool may or may not be known. And, and ops, that's changing very much now that we have kind of infrastructure as code, uh, where in some organizations, at least, ops is doing a lot of basically development. And they have their entire their own delivery stack. You know, they have a Jenkins often, but they then have Cucumber or a bunch of other tools to, you know, Puppet Chef to verify your manifests or your Docker files nowadays if you've already switched there or whatever. So people, different people have, long story short, different people, different levels of knowledge and different expectations for all these tools. Start talking about a little bit about continuous integration. So I don't think anybody, well, it's a, it's a de facto part of uh, most continuous delivery tool sets. Why? Because you need typically to verify or to run some first uh, checks on you know, the, the code that you're about to try to push out there. Um, so there's some testing, some static analysis, some, you know, you might be using it as your gateway to your main branch if you're using things like the validated merge plugin where you actually don't put anything in your main branch until it's passed a couple of uh, validation builds and those kind of things. Um, there's a ton of CI tools out there. It's not a new technology. Um, some of the challenges I've seen and things that you should think about or if you haven't already thought about them are scalability. In the context of continuous delivery, you will run a lot of CI jobs, depending on how frequent you make them. Um, and it's not going to help you a lot to have an efficient CD process if you only have two build servers and they only always fall over. So getting some kind of scalability here is uh, very important. Um, uh, there have been a bunch of talks here about this. You know, CloudBees, uh, there's some hosted services that will give you some options in this area. If you want to run this on-prem, just make sure that you have you know, enough resource available, and certainly look at some of the plugins that, uh, that do this for you, some of the cloud scaling plugins, the JClouds plugin, the Docker plugin, and so on. Different types of builds. Uh, polyglot development, uh, I guess that was the buzzword maybe two years ago. We're just going to do more and more, diff build more and more different types of things. Uh, the BMW talk was, was fascinating to see that in an embedded world. Uh, yeah, obviously, nowadays, most people do some kind of mobile development. They do some back-end development. Um, Internet of Things will change as you'll do more and more development. Basically, you need to make sure your CI, CI server supports different types of builds. And that also means different types of build infrastructure. So you know, if you're doing Mac stuff, you might need a, a Mac slave. Just make sure you have right amount of these. And then the other thing that's worth looking at from your CI server perspective, does it give you the right level of granularity of access control? Because you run a pipeline, it's not just your developers who will be going in there 
you know, looking at workspaces, triggering builds, and so on. But you might have the QA teams, you might have operations, DBAs, and so on. You don't want your developers somehow being able to rerun the production deployment job, and so on. Uh, so you need to think about the access control model here. And I don't know, everybody who's played with the Jenkins access control model will have their own opinion on how easy it is to set that up in a way that, uh, that is really usable. All right, um, environment provisioning. So this is not so much about scaling your CI server itself or your CD uh, infrastructures. That was sort of the last slide. This is really about having target environments in which you can test your applications. Um, mobile makes this a little more interesting because the target environment is really usually people out there in the world. But if you're building server-side apps or, or desktop applications or something, then yeah, you, you want a pool of machines that you can run your tests on. Because a lot of the tests that you're going to do need your application to be really running, not in an emulator, and it's not a unit test that you're just running against the code. So what we really want to be able to do is to have a way to define a kind of test environment that we need and create it on demand when we need it. And there's a trillion tools that will do that for a specific technology. So thinking you know, Amazon CloudFormation here, thinking OpsWorks, thinking OpenStack Heap, thinking whatever. Um, but that's great if that's the only technology that you're using. Most of the time what we see is that as you have different types of technologies, you'll have different types of test environments you need. And you might have some VMware in-house, but you might want to burst out to OpenStack for a certain number of use cases, and then you need to add some data to the database. And so it's a very hybrid kind of setup. And in general, you'll need a way to easily create these environments in whatever you environment or whatever uh, landscape you have. But it's not just about being able to invoke all these actions in the right sequence, so call, uh, v v VI Java or vSphere, and then run Puppet on the machine, and then and so on. It's also about making sure that this new environment is actually usable from the rest of your tooling. Um, it's great to have a console where you can click a button, like a run deck job or something, which gives you back five new VMs and prints out their IP addresses. But <laughs> if you then have to take those IP addresses and copy-paste them into some other tool so that you can deploy to them or run your tests, then you haven't, you know, you've gained something, but not all that much. So the other challenge in the environment provisioning space is not just to create these environments, but to make the rest of your tooling aware of them. Um, so if, you, yeah, if you're trying to do everything with Jenkins, for instance, that might mean that you have to pre-package uh, a Jenkins slave you know, with each one of these, a Jenkins agent with each one of these nodes, or you have to trigger Jenkins automatically to go back into the machine and install uh, the slave on it. Uh, depends on the technology you're using, but think about that uh, specific step. A deployment. So this is, I guess, one of the areas where we start getting towards the boundary of what I would consider the sweet spot of Jenkins. If you're deploying to a pass, like a Google App Engine or a Cloud Foundry or OpenShift or something, there's a plugin that does this for you. And that's nice, because that's exactly the job of a pass. You give it your code, and it'll do the rest of the work. But most of the time, if you're doing on-prem deployments or deploying to some arbitrary middleware stack or to an AMI that you've created, you have to run a set of commands to make this happen. And of course, Jenkins can do that, and an ECI tool can do that. It's called a window. It's called run my script, and then you type in your script, and it'll run it. And then you do that for you know, 20, 30 different applications, different target environments, and then you have to run it on multiple machines, or you have one box, you try to SSH to another box, and then you have to figure out what to do with the username and password, and all this kind of stuff. Long story short, if you don't have a very simple application where you're copying one file into one server, as soon as you have to do things like run DBA, DB updates, modify configuration, change load balancer settings, all that kind of stuff, scripting your own deployment in a CI tool is a real pain. Um, and yeah, you know, how do people do deployments today? You could have a manual to do this. It's not great if you're trying to build CD pipelines. You can use a, a remote executor tool, something like you know, Fabric, Funk, Rundeck, M Collective, whatever to do this, but then you're still scripting it yourself. Or you can look at, there are classes of deployment automation tools. We make one, there are others that will try to give you the same pass-like experience. Here's my package, you just get it done. Um, 
and, and I guess the main thing here is you, you don't have to script it yourself. And you can try to avoid some kind of a duplication. So if you think about, say, deploying, I don't know, a WAR file to Tomcat, or maybe a data source definition to Tomcat, if you do that from 10 applications, it should be the same step every time. So to have 10 jobs that really copy the same step, and then if you want to modify it, you have to go into 10 jobs and change it. That's also a bit of a waste. You want really somebody else to take care of this kind of thing. Certainly something like Docker with this idea of a, a, a layerable definition of your target container where you could swap out the, the data source part easily. It uh, will be interesting to see how that evolves, but I don't think anybody's figured out how to make that easy yet. Deployment has a bunch of other standard problems that you would expect a tool to solve or you're going to have to solve yourself. Um, these are the things like how to handle environment-specific variables, um, how to make sure only the right people can deploy to the right environments, and so on. So that's obviously additional stuff uh, that you would expect a tool to do for you or you have to think about as you uh, build out your CD thing. Or you can find a way to avoid them. I mean, that's the best thing. Don't have this problem. Don't have environment-specific values. Uh, don't build environment-specific applications. Test management. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Well, the trend nowadays, I guess, is not to have like an enormous load runner or an HP quality center, now called HP ALM, sitting somewhere in a corner, run by the QA team over there, doing their stuff, and then they come back with this yes, no answer. Um, the way of doing testing nowadays is uh, you have usually a ton of different test tools for different types of tests regression, integration, security, uh, usability, unit, whatever. Um, and that's great, and you write more and more tests, and that's even better. And a CI tool normally has good integrations with quite a lot of these test tools and can trigger all these tests. But the more tests you have and the more tests you ha uh, test tools you have, the harder it starts to get to answer the one real question that's really interesting from a continuous delivery perspective, does it go live? There's really only one interesting question from a perspective of testing. Am I confident enough about the quality and the risk of this particular candidate to put it into my production environment? And the more tests and the more test tools you have, the harder this gets. If anybody's tried to aggregate somehow in Jenkins the different results from all the different tools, which are spread across different jobs, of course, because they happen in different parts of the pipeline, and has tried to come up with one nice visualization of this, if, you've d if, if it was easy, then you've done an amazing job, and I would really like to see what you've done. It's just not easy in, in practice. So people have you know, they have PowerPoint presentations, and they sit and they open 10 different logs or views. It, it's just a nightmare. So there has to be some way in which you can... You know, you need to think If you run that many tests, you need to think about how can we get all this stuff back together to help us make a, a qualified, if you like, a good no-go go, no, go decision. Um, and I guess one thing to add to that is that all tests passing, everything's green, is this kind of vanilla example, but that's not what real life is like. If you have more than five tests, chances are some of them will keep failing and you're going to be okay with it. Now, I know at JClouds, for instance, we have I don't know 10,000 tests or whatever when we do a release. I don't know the exact number. And there are 18 tests, live tests for Amazon EC2 that have failed for the last release, and we know the cause. The test itself is not very stable, um, and we're not going to fix it immediately. We just accept it. That's fine. So making this, what I'm trying to say is that making this go, no go decision is m a more complicated question than just saying, did they all pass? So to set up your Jenkins pipeline to say, well, if any of the tests fail, I'm going to abort the pipeline is not really realistic if you have any serious amount of tests. And in any case, for things like performance tests, there is no notion of pass or fail in general. You have to look at the performance of the system now in relation to the system before or under certain circumstances to, to make this decision. So there's a test management challenge in continuous delivery about how even to get to the go, no go decision, but there's also a challenge as you get more and more tests, how to make it efficient. Um, I call it the Google problem. Those of you who have spoken to me today, you've heard this story before. Google has too many tests for quite a lot of systems to be able to run them every time. A, it takes too long, and B, it's too expensive. So they have a very smart machine learning-based static analysis system where they look at the commit, and based on the commit, they analyze which parts of the system will be affected. 
and then based on the history of tests that they've run, they identify a subset of tests that they want to run for this specific commit automatically. It's cool. But, of course, it's not something we're going to have like immediately. It's millions of dollars worth of investment. But what, we, what, what, what I think is worth thinking about is how can I make tests context-specific? How can I somehow annotate a test with you know, information about what it's testing so that when I run a specific pipeline, I can run those tests that are most relevant for me right now? And it's a trade-off, right? You can say, I need a pipeline to be really quick, so I'm only going to verify the essential parts, the parts that have changed. Or I don't care so much about speed, but I have a, a smaller tolerance for failure. So I'm going to run more tests. And then as, the, as time goes on, of course, we want to make sure the tests stay the relevant ones. We all have know the famous unit tests that have been green for the past you know, 7,000 builds. Are they actually telling us anything valuable? Um, we could probably disable them, and it wouldn't really change. We wouldn't throw them away, but we, you know, they're just noise, ultimately. They make it harder to see what's really changing in the application, where we need to focus. So finally, pipeline orchestration of the ones we were discussing. I call this release management, or release coordination in the initial slide for the following reason. Um, I always find it kind of curious how if I speak to a release manager about the process, you know, what does a release manager do? They will say something like, well, when the developers have finished working, uh, we start to have this release plan, and then we run through all these steps, and then when we're finished, the application is in production. And if you speak to someone who's a continuous delivery guru or in fan, they will describe exactly the same process, but they will call it a continuous delivery pipeline. And the people on the one side don't really understand the people on the other side and so on. To me, of course, they're technically totally different. Release managers tend to use Microsoft Excel or MS Project or Confluence or emails or whatever. And then we will have meetings 8 o'clock every morning where we explain what we did yesterday who's never been in a meeting like that. <laughs> um, so how it's done is totally different, but the process that we're looking at is exactly the same. Here today, we're probably more interested in the kind of continuous delivery style, maybe coming more from the development space where we're talking about pipelines. So the things I think that are very important from the perspective of your toolkit are, do you have a tool that allows you to define the pipeline in such a way that your pipeline can go to production? Most of the time when I speak to people, certainly who've built pipelines from the development department, uh, it's kind of like, so how far does your pipeline go? Oh, well, it goes to the QA environment, the, the quality assurance environment, or pre-production. Why? Well, because, you know, when we have to go to production, then there's all these meetings, and you need approvals, and it can't be automated, and we don't have access to the machines anyway, uh, so we're not going to do it. And that's, there's nothing wrong with having an automated system to get code into pre-production. That's great. It's very convenient and useful. But it's not continuous delivery. Continuous delivery isn't just about building a pipeline that gets to production. The whole point of continuous delivery is to get the code to your customer so you can see how they react. And then you can use that information to feed back to the beginning of the chain where you think of what the next feature is that you're going to build. I'm not saying that, you know, it's not worth building a pipeline to pre-production, but the goal has to be that this thing has to go through to production or we're never really going to get the value out of continuous delivery that people are talking about. So you need a tool to do that. And you need a tool that can support the process, you know, the process that it takes to get from development through to production. Uh, one of the things that uh, I run across very often, and I see that even in our own releases, so we have... In that, especially in that last phase, whenever we release a new version of Excel Deploy or Excel Release or whatever, we have a couple of manual tasks. Um, some of them are manual because we've been too lazy to automate them, and some of them are manual because they're just probably always going to be manual, like we write a blog post and we have a meeting with our press people to try to figure out how best to market it and things like this. Um, that's part of our pipeline. How would I ever put this in Jenkins? I have no idea. Writing a blog post? So... We, how can you have a tool that will allow you to describe a pipeline or a release process that can A, handle manual activities, and B, will handle variation? So um, uh, the classic continuous delivery idea is, you know, uh, it's always the same. Your pipeline runs the same way. And if it fails at a certain point, uh, then you're done. 
and you make a new commit, and then you try all over again. But if you have a release process that takes like I don't know, 48 hours or something like that, and you're almost at the end, or a week or two weeks, you're almost at the end, and something goes wrong, and you just need to do this one little thing to fix it, and then, or you, you might need to move the order of certain tasks, or you might need to rerun a certain step, are you going to like stop it and start all over again? Well, most likely not in reality. So, but how do you do that in a tool that has a rigid view of a pipeline? Well, you can't. So you cheat. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, you add a comment or you write an email or you do something like that. But then you're sort of missing a little bit of audit trail, plus you're fooling yourself that your release process, your pipeline, is, is always the same when in reality it's not. So this is really important information. If you deviate from your pipeline, why should that be a, a big problem? I mean, you don't want to do that forever, but you certainly want to know that it happens because that tells you about places where your process can be improved. And that's... I think a really important point is that the other thing with uh, a pipeline that is supposed to be fully automated from end to end is that if you don't happen to have that today, it can seem like an enormously mm -hmm. difficult or impossible task to achieve. Uh, and it's very difficult to go to your, if you're really passionate about continuous delivery. You, know, you can tell great stories about how Netflix or LinkedIn or Etsy or whatever, you know, they deploy 25 times a day. Somebody has an idea, 10 minutes later the customer is trying it out. Isn't that amazing? And then if you say, well, yeah, but first we need to automate our entire process, that'll take about six months, maybe cost you know, half a million euros or something like that. They're not going to do it, are they? It's much more convincing to be able to say, well, you know what, we can build a pipeline with the process we have now, and then we can figure out where the problem is or where the big bottlenecks are, and then we can start moving towards continuous delivery until we get to the point where we, we feel we're happy, we're done. So... Think about what kind of tooling you can have uh, or, or might use in order to do this. And it can be a combination of tools. You, know, you can use Jenkins up until a certain point and then switch over to something else. As long as you find a way to show it in an end-to-end -end way and, and you get the information you need in order to figure out where can I improve it, there's no problem with that. Or, or you know, you pick, pick something else or you do it manually, whatever. The other thing that's important about the pipeline is that um, a pipeline tool ultimately is the highest level of visibility of this entire process. And who's really interested in this process? Of course, we all are in the teams because it's showing us where we are in, in, in our delivery. But the person who's really interested is the customer, the person who's ordered the software in the first place. I like to think of continuous delivery as a sort of track and trace principle. Um, you know, if you order, I don't know, you use one of these apps to order food, so you say, okay, I want uh, a large pizza. Um, how did that work like five years ago? Uh, well, you called them and you said, I want a large pizza. And uh, they said, okay, we'll be there sometime. And then you sit and wait and sit and wait and, and sit and wait. And then the pizza arrives and it's cold and it's not the pizza you ordered and you're frustrated. Uh, and this is pretty much the experience our, the people who pay our salaries, our customers have of software delivery. That's what it's like. It's like ordering a pizza five years ago. What happens now? You order a pizza, and you know, they tell you, they show you, they give you some you know, like app or website or whatever, and then they show you, well, it's currently being made, and you know, it, the estimate is about 37 minutes, and then they put it on a motorbike, and you can see them follow the bike. That's what we're used to. If you track and trace a parcel, you know, you know at any given point in time, when is it going to be there? Uh, what's the estimated delivery date? Why should software not be like that? That's the promise of continuous delivery. That's why it's so cool. Because it, you know, you, the person who ordered the piece of software can, should be able to type in, I ordered feature, uh, deploy it, 4728. Oh, it's in the QA phase. 47% uh, done, no warnings, should be here on Thursday. That's what it should be like. Yeah, I, know, I, I laugh when I tell this story as well because it seems so unrealistic. But... We're basically telling people that software delivery should be something we as customers would never accept, never. So let's think about this a little bit. What kind of, but, but this, what I was saying, this track and trace page, if you want to have a pipeline orchestrator, it should support this kind of track and trace ability. And CI tools typically are one level too low for that. It's a bit like you doing track and trace on the Deutsche Post website by watching their fleet management system. 
showing you all the trucks and how heavy they are and how fast they move and who's driving it. Who cares? What you care about is when it's going to be there. So the pipe, oh, hello. Oh, I've got a meeting about OpenShift. I'm sorry. Um, well, I've got to finish then on time. Um, your pipeline orchestrator either itself should have the kind of high-level interface that will help the business or the customer follow the progress of a specific feature through the pipeline, or you will need something on top of that to communicate this information back to your customer. If you have something that is essentially only relevant to highly technical people who understand Git SHA-1 IDs, that's the wrong thing. No. So almost finished. I know I have five minutes. The one thing that I was going to add here, so yes, introducing a toolkit all sounds great. Picking the right tools for your goals sounds great. But how do your current automation tools get chosen? How did they build this thing? Uh, one of the challenges we see is that most organizations have a tendency to try to pick tools that are specific to a certain, organization, a certain part of the organization. It's very hard to find organizations that are good at picking tools that are supposed to cross boundaries between teams. So to try to change this, if you think about continuous delivery, it's also about changing the way we do tool evaluation, tool introduction, tool implementation, uh, and getting multiple people to work with the same things. So there's a final plug, obviously, some of the things we've talked about. Um, enough about that. Thank you to all the sponsors, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>